Bo na to sam to zaslał, sam nie to pamiętam. Jedem, jedem, jedem. Aj, to je mi. Samo zvedaj, če je proti še tudi, ne? Ponesem. A microphone, Tama, in that? Is this one I'm using?
Have you attacked up the minute? Yeah. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats. I will be welcoming the official prelates uh, and His Holiness very shortly. Uh, but before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, if you could please keep your phones on silent just to avoid any distractions during the presentations. And if you haven't already seen the restrooms, they are located outside the auditorium uh, to the left or your right as you exit. Uh, feel free to take photos and videos during today's symposium. However, we respectfully ask you not to leave your seats. We do have professional photography here today, and the photos will be made available at the end of the day. Uh, after each guest speaker's presentation, there will be a 10-minute Q&A session. So for any of you that do have questions, uh, please make your way uh, in a line to the microphone, uh, but we will direct you at the end of the presentation. Um, and just finally, you've all been gifted with conference packs. Uh, that contain today's agenda and additional resources. Uh, as the packs contain Holy Scripture and the Holy Cross, 
Should you choose not to take the pack with you, uh, we ask that you do leave them on your seat and a committee member will take them from you at the end of the day. Please be upstanding for the official entry of His Holiness and the pre Prelates. Please remain upstanding as His Holiness blesses today's symposium in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Amen. In the glorious light, O my Lord, of thy revelation, and in the joyful epiphany of thy coming, which all creatures whom thou hast created look for, hope for, and expect, make us all in thy loving kindness and mercies worthy to be glad and to rejoice in. With all of the true sons of thy mysteries in the Jerusalem which is above, O Lord of all, Father and Son and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Please be seated. Your Holiness, Morawa rule, Morawa the third, Catholicos Patriarch, your beatitude, Mormi Lizea Metropolitan AM, your graces. Mor binyamin ilia, mor abres yuchana, reverend fathers and deacons, respected speakers, proto-presbyter Dr. Doru Kostaki, reverend archdeacon Kashisha William Tuma, and Dr. Ken Parry, good morning. A very warm greeting to each of you. The Assyrian Church of the East, Archdiocese of Australia, New Zealand, and Lebanon, together with Nasibus Assyrian Theological College, welcomes you to the 2022 Assyrian Church of the East Theological Symposium, today on the 28th of May, 2022. My name is Sydney Karampour. I'm overjoyed and humbled to be your MC for this event. It is my special pleasure to welcome you to this symposium and on behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our deep appreciation for your attendance today. 
It is an honor for us to be graced with the attendance and participation of the keynote presenter, His Holiness, Morawa III, Catholicos Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East. This symposium coincides with the inaugural visit to Australia by His Holiness, following his consecration as the 122nd Catholicos Patriarch in September 2021. By the divine grace and will of God, this symposium today will shed light on the pearl that is the Assyrian Church of the East. His Holiness and our esteemed speaker speakers will specifically cover the themes of Syriac theology, patristics, and history. The beginnings of the Assyrian Church of the East are rooted in the first decades of the missionary activities that took place in the apostolic era. Established by the apostles St. Thomas, St. Thaddeus, and St. Bartholomew, the cradle of the Church of the East was in Mesopotamia where it developed its first center at Seleucia Ctesiphon. The P Assyrian people of Mesopotamia have always been an integral part of the Church of the East, though historically they've only been one ethnic group among many others in the church. As you will come to learn from our speakers, the church experienced remarkable expansions with missionaries carrying the good news from Persia to India, and even as far as China. Occasionally referred to as the Church of Martyrs, the Church of the East also suffered great waves of atrocities and persecutions throughout the ages, and up until recent times at the hands of Islamic State, resulting in today's communities of diaspora throughout the world. Though us Assyrians have been uprooted from our homeland, our holy church, as a spiritual mother, has always clothed her sons and daughters with the armor of God and nourished them with spiritual food. I pray today's symposium will deepen your understanding of the Assyrian Church of the East, that it will enrich your knowledge and love for God and the saving faith, and offer you a blessed, faith-filled and formative experience. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to welcome His Grace, Mod Binyamin Ilya, Bishop of Victoria, New Zealand, and Principal of Nasibus Assyrian Theological College to deliver his welcome and opening remarks. Please welcome His Grace, Baruch <laughs> Thank you, Sydney. Your Holiness, Mar Awa III, Catholicos Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, His Beatitude, Mar Milizaya A.M., His Grace, Mar Abris Yohanan, Reverend Fathers, Deacons, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure as the principal of Nisibus to welcome you to this symposium that has been organized by the Assyrian Church of the East and Nisibis Assyrian Theological College. The college was established in 2020 for the purpose of providing tertiary level theological education to further enhance the teachings of the Assyrian Church. The name Nisibis was taken from the original name of the school of Nisibis which was the educational establishment of the Church of the East. It was an important spiritual center of the early Church of the East, and it is also referred to as the world's first university. The school was established in 350 AD in Nisibis and had three primary departments teaching theology, philosophy, and medicine. Some of its famous teachers were Saint Nase and Saint Ephraim the Great. Due to many persecutions committed against the Church of the East, 
the church had not had an official theological college for the last seven centuries. However, by the grace of God, the church has been able to establish the official theological college here in Sydney, Australia. The college plans to expand further and with the blessings of His Holiness and working in partnership with Sydney College of Divinity, we are in the process of opening another branch of Nisibis in our ancestral homeland, which will cater for students that are based in the Middle East and will be accredited by SCD. Today, more than ever, theological education is fundamental to humanity. It assists with the spiritual understanding of society and helps us to truly understand the meaning of life. When this understanding becomes effective, it elevates us to a higher level of spirituality and we experience the world from a spiritual lens. As Saint Ephraim labels it, the luminous eye. Theological education helps us to further comprehend the scriptures, which provide us with the answers to our daily challenges. It is the living and life-giving word of God. The purpose of theology is to bring humanity closer to God and not to bring condemnation upon one another. It helps us to unify the members of Christ into one healthy and safe body, which is his holy church. Again, I welcome you all and I take this opportunity to thank His Holiness and our presenters for, our, for accepting our invitation. And I would also like to thank the following people who have worked tirelessly to bring this symposium together. I would like to thank Father Neil Mako, Deacon Michael Odisho, Deacon Stephen Michael, Lecter Rob Khnanishu, Ninue Yusuf, Ninos Aaron, Renia Bustani, Sydney Karampur, and Sandy Jammu. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Thank you, Your Grace. I'd now like to welcome His Beatitude, Marmi Lizaya, Metropolitan of the Archdiocese of Australia, New Zealand, and Lebanon, to deliver his welcoming and opening statement. Please welcome his beatitude, Baruch Mar. Thank you, Your Holiness, uh, Your Graces, distinguished guests. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we begin today's introduction, I would like to on behalf of the members of the Assyrian Church of the East Diocese of Archdiocese of Australia, New Zealand, and Lebanon, welcome His Holiness Mar Awa, the third Catholicos Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, to the very first symposium held by Nasibis Assyrian Theological College in Australia. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the Tharawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elder past and present. I would like to welcome not only our guest speakers, but also the participants that haven't uh, joined us today. We are extremely blessed and pleased to have you all attended and I welcome each and every one of you to this symposium. I'm certain that we will all have a wonderful time hearing from our guest speakers. Today, Nasibis College will strive to continue with its original vision of being learning hub for Christianity. In future, we are hopeful that Nasibis College will not only produce eminent clergy scholars, but also publish academic papers and journals hold lectures and present academic and scholarly debates by way of symposiums such as this one. Will be, uh, Nasibis will be 
uh, as this that will be conducted in the advancement of the faith that will spread the word of God and the beauty and significance of his holy church on earth, not only to the faithful, but more importantly to the community at large, assuring to safeguard the Christian faith for many generations to come. Please enjoy your day, and I pray that you take with you not only the knowledge of God, but his blessings too, as we eagerly await to hear from our distinguished speakers, God's blessings with you all, and thank you. Thank you, Your Beatitude. On the 13th of September, 2021, the Holy and Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East was blessed by the ordination of His Holiness, Morawa III, Catholicos Patriarch. His Holiness was ordained a deacon on the 19th of January, 1992 at St. George Cathedral in Chicago by the late His Holiness, Mardenchad IV, and then later ordained a priest on the 23rd of May, 1999, again by His Holiness, Mardenchad IV. And this date did fall on the Feast of the Pentecost. Patriarch Mar Awa was sent for graduate studies in theology to Rome in June of 1999, and in 2001, he graduated with a licentiate of sacred theology from the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome. And in 2007, received his Doctor of Sacred Theology in Eastern Liturgy from the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome. On the 8th of September, 2021, the Holy Synod elected His Grace Morawa Ruam, Bishop of the Diocese of California, as the 122nd Catholicos Patriarch to the Apostolic See of Seleucia Ctesiphon. In the short eight months as our Patriarch, His Holiness has demonstrated His sincere love and desire for unity in Christ between the children of our Holy Church and sister churches across the globe. The Church of, her, of the East, in her glory, is known for many firsts, such as taking the gospel to China and possessing a rich history of patriarchs from Jewish, Asian, and Assyrian descent. His Holiness extends this history by being the first Western-born Patriarch of the Church of the East. Here to discuss the establishment of the primatal see of Seleucia Ctesiphon, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding to welcome His Holiness, Marawa III, Catholicos Patriarch. Thank you. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Marminus, the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Australia, New Zealand, and Lebanon, your Grace Bishop Marbinyamin, the Bishop of the Diocese of Victoria, New Zealand, and the Principal of Nisibis Theological College. Your Grace Bishop Marabras, the Bishop of Kirkuk, Indiana, and our uh, Patriarchal Auxiliary, Reverend Fathers, Reverend Clergy, esteemed scholars, guests, ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to each and every one of you. It is my great joy to be here with you this morning on this inaugural symposium sponsored and presented by the Nisibis Theological Assyrian College under the auspices of the Assyrian Church of the East, the Archdiocese of Australia and New Zealand, and Lebanon. And this is the first formal theological institution of the Assyrian Church in recent times, which was established uh, a few years ago, as Bishop Marbin Yaman outlined, 
by our Metropolitan and our Patriarchal Vicar, His Eminence, Maramidas. And I want to thank him for that vision and for that very important step in the life of the Church. I would also like to offer my thanks to Bishop Marbanyam and the Principal for uh, his efforts at the College and for introducing this first uh, theological symposium. And it is my hope that this will be the first among many and it is my joy to be here among you for this inaugural event. I'd like to afford myself of the opportunity to encourage all of our youngsters and all of our upcoming theologians to enroll at Nisibis, a Syrian theological college, in order to have a broader perspective on theological matters. Formally, the theology has always been divided between the Latin West and the Greek East and oftentimes the Syriac-speaking churches, particularly the Church of the East, has been forgotten. But I'm happy that Nisibis will now remind everyone that we have a very important part of the universal church, and that is the Church of the East, or the Assyrian Church of the East, which makes use of Syriac. It is said that in the patristic period, the average sermon was about one hour long. But I won't apply that rule today. And I see that I've only been given about half an hour, but uh, I may take a few moments more. My talk this morning is about the establishment of the primatial see of the Church of the East, which is the more common or more historical name for the Assyrian Church of the East. Both are. Um, are utilized by the church. And uh, the simple reason for that is because as the head of the church, a primacy is important both internally and externally uh, for the ecclesiology of the church in general and for the Assyrian church in particular. And I'd like to begin with this quote. And we too, the persecuted ones who are entrusted with the great household of God which is the Holy Church, by the command of God the Father of truth, and by the well-pleasing uh, well -pleasing of his beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the permission of the Spirit, the Paraclete, by the word that is living and which dies not, by which our Holy Fathers gave this glorious gift of the Patriarchate to this Holy See of this great Church of Kuche in the twin cities of Seleucia Stesiphon, do draw near and beseech, we also, your feeble, weak, and pitiable servants, with prayer and supplication, that the same spiritual gift, which is the Patriarchate, may be preserved in mercy to this administrator whom is chosen to sit upon this holy see until the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ." End quote. At first hearing, this text may seem to be a dire plea by a Christian community fleeing from some sort of persecution, published in a modern-day media outlet, not dissimilar to what was heard from the Christians who fled the atrocities of ISIS in both Iraq and Syria in the early summer of 2014. However, this text has nothing to do with ISIS, or at least not with a persecution that has taken place in our modern era. Rather, it is an ancient prayer text of the Assyrian Church of the East found in the liturgy for the consecration and enthronement of the primate of the church, namely the Catholicos Patriarch of Seleucia Stesiphon. This primacy forged during the early centuries of one of the most ancient churches of Christendom has survived the vicissitudes of ecclesiastical history down through these now more than 17 centuries. This primacy continues to thrive today in an atmosphere not that strikingly dissimilar to the very context and circumstances that gave birth to it. At the dawn of Christianity and during its birth in the apostolic age, the world of antiquity was divided between the Roman Empire ruling in the West and the Persian Empire ruling in the East, or East of the Roman Limes, as, was, as it was known. For many centuries, the two rival superpowers battled for control over a vast territory. And oftentimes, the vulnerable Christian communities on either side suffered various waves of persecution, oscillating back and forth between the two, 
depending upon the whims and fancies of the respective ruler. While the Roman West was still officially pagan, the Christian community under the Persians enjoyed relative freedom, and I underline the word relative. However, that all changed in the year 313 when Constantine the Great officially permitted Christianity to operate freely within his empire, which, of course, was a, jo a cause of joy for those in the West. Thus, the great persecution of the Christians of the Roman West ended that very year. However, the Christians of Persia continue, continue to suffer at the hands of the Magian Persians at a time when peace prevailed for the believers who were under the Romans. The history of the primacy of Seleucia Stesiphon begins sometime around the year 315 AD, when Papa Bar Gagai, who was the first bishop of the Persian capital, uh, appears on the scene. The Persian emperors during the Parthian dynasty established their empire's capital on the twin cities of Seleucia Stesiphon, later referred to by the Arabs as Al Madain. The former city was established on the right bank of the Tigris as the principal city during the Seleucid era, 311 to 129 BC, under Seleucus I Nikerher. This city had a very Hellenistic character, being established by one of Alexander the Great's most notable generals in the east. The other city, Stisiphon, on the left bank of the Tigris, was established by the Sassanids in 226, soon after the Arsacid dynasty established itself in Parthia under Ardashir I, and gradually conquered the territory of the Seleucids. At the beginning of Shapur the Great's reign, sometime around 315, the bishop of the twin royal cities began to emerge as the dominant hierarch of the Persian East. At this time, Marpapa Bargagai was the occupant of the Sea of Seleucia, and he began to endear himself gradually to the Persian monarch. According to the ecclesiastical tradition of the Church of the East, Papa was consecrated as bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon around the year 280 by the bishops Achadawoi of Arbil and Hawil or Abel of Sus. At a time when the borders between the Roman West and the Persian East were still rather fluid, Papa began to assert his position above that of the other bishops in the Persian territory. Supported by the emperor, Papa is said to be the first to use the title Catholicos, thus asserting a sort of primacy above all of the other bishops in the Persian East. The term Catholicos, which is Greek in origin, of course, and means universal, was the title previously utilized by the four great generals of Alexander the Macedonian, who later ruled his vast empire after his death. The assertion of primacy on the part of the bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon was contested by the other bishops in the east, namely by Milis of Shush and Shumun bar Sabae of Ilam, both of whom were later martyred under Shapur II in the Great Persecution. This ecclesiastical dispute was taken up in the famous Council of Seleucia Stesiphon sometime around the year 315. Some scholars assert that Papa appealed to the closest primatial see uh, in order to assert his position as Seleucia, particularly the see of Edessa. The bishop of Edessa, a certain Sada, and possibly also James, the bishop of Nisibis, who, as we know, was president at the Council of Nicaea, are said to have been the bishops who received the appeal of Marpapa, eventually ruling in his favor and condemning, condemning his opponents. It was this so-called Edessan Council that the primacy of Papa as bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon was defended, and Papa's opposing party were deposed. Scholars will also claim that since Edessa was a suffragan of the bishop, later patriarch of Antioch, that it was ultimately the see of Antioch that granted the bishop of the Persian capital the right of primacy. Although Edessa was the capital of the Roman province of Osirowene, it constantly shifted between Roman and Persian rule, 
as it lay immediately on the frontier between the two rival empires. This allowed for, among other things, what I term ecclesiastical fluidity in matters pertaining to the liturgy and to the life of the church in general. However, it has never been clear as to what, if any, role was played by Roman Antioch during this period. We also have the further tradition of the so-called letter of Constantine to Papa, in which the Roman emperor congratulates Mar Papa on his accession to the primacy of the Christians in Persia. Although this letter is thought to be apocryphal, it nevertheless indicated a time when the Roman Christians were quite interested in what their counterparts in the Persian territory were engaged in. Another letter is said to have been sent around the same time by the mother of Constantine, Queen Helena, to Mar Papa in order to seek his prayers and blessings as the primate of the Persian East. Although there are no formal act of the Council of Seleucia Stesiphon, it is generally agreed that the bishops succumbed to Papa's assertion of primacy as, quote, the great metropolitan of the East, most certainly not without influence and strong arming on the part of the emperor. And the two factions were later ultimately reconciled. It is actually with the acts of the Synod of Dadishu in 424 that we know the details concerning the events surrounding the primacy and Catholicate of Marpapa. As part of the reconciliation agreement, Shumon Bar Sabae, one of Marpapa's major opponents, became the archdeacon of Papa the Catholicos and was given the right to succeed Papa upon his death. This materialized around the year 336 when Papa the First Catholicos left his, this fleeting world after a bout of paralysis caused, according to the tradition, by Mar Papa striking the book of the Gospels during the Council of Seleucia Stesiphon. It is said that the aged Mar Papa struck the Evangelarium, or the Gospel book, bidding it to witness on his behalf in order to solidify his position for the primacy. The Gospel book later then responded by making sure that Mar Papa became paralytic. The period following the Council of Seleucia Stesiphon and the death of Mar Papa, roughly from 336 to 410, is lacking in strong documentary evidence in regards to the primacy of the See of Seleucia Stesiphon, although the tradition of the church is there, of course. However, as with all things in the East, word of mouth goes quite a long way. However, the majority of this period witnessed the vast wave of persecution of the Christians in the Persian territory under Shapur II. While Papa seems to have enjoyed relative freedom during the very beginning of the Christ Christianization of the Roman Empire, Marshumad Bar Sabae, Papa's successor, experienced just the opposite. Only three years into his primacy as Catholicos of Seleucia Stesiphon, so around the year 339 AD, the great persecution of the East was initiated by Shapur. The annals of church history indicate that hundreds of thousands of Christians were killed during the period from 339 to 379, which is when Shapur died. Almost all of the successors of Marshal Bar Sabae were also martyred, up to and including the Catholicos to Marsa, who died in 370. From 346 to 363, there was a vacancy of the primacy, a primate of Seleucia Stesiphon. It was only Qayyuma, who was Catholicos from 371 to 399, who reluctantly accepted the primatial see, who was uniquely spared the death of a martyr. It was during his tenure that the great persecution of the East ended in 379. Sometime in 382, 383, peace was established between the Byzantine Emperor Arcadius and Shapur II, the third rather, who ruled from 383 to 388. Later, Shapur III was succeeded by his brother Bahram IV, in 399, who in turn was succeeded by Yazdegerd I 
in 399, and he ruled until 420. As Marqayuma had been somewhat forced to accept the Catholicate rather reluctantly, he resigned upon the establishment of peace between the two rivaling superpowers. The, the West Syrian scholar Barabreus mentions in his ecclesiastical history that some five years after the election of Marqayuma, he abdicated the primatial throne in the presence of Marmaruta of Martyropolis, or Maifarqat, who was sent as an emissary of the Roman Byzantine West to broker peace with the Persians. The bishops of the Church of the East at that time reluctantly accepted the abdication of Qayyuma, and in his stead elected Isaac I of Kashkar as the Catholicos of Seleucia Stesiphon sometime in 399. With the accession of Isaac to the primatial see of Seleucia Stesiphon, we have the first formally recorded synod of the Church of the East. During this council, the title of Catholicus was formally adopted by the primate of the Church of Persia, or at least was officially recorded in the acts of that synod. Isaac is styled in this synod as the, quote, Metropolitan of Seleucia Stesiphon, and the Catholicus, and the head over all the bishops of the East. Although some have asserted that Patriarch Joseph I, who reigned from 552 to 67, edited the Acts of the Council in order to include the title of Catholicos to Isaac's name. Nonetheless, the primacy of the great metropolitan of Seleucia Stesiphon was already quite well established. Although Yezdegir I was initially tolerant to Christians, he later began to sporadically persecute the church at the end of his reign. And after Isaac the Catholicos, most notably during the Patriarchate of Ma'na around 420. During the reign of the Persian monarch Yazdegerd, the Church of the East in the Persian territory and the Patriarchate itself began to expand. Yazdegerd formally recognized the primacy of the great metropolitan and Catholicos in 410, thus somewhat mimicking the Edict of Milan by Constantine in 313. Churches, shrines of the martyrs, monasteries, and other houses of worship soon to began established throughout all of the Persian East, with the number of Christians in Persian diplomatic and bureaucratic positions steadily increasing. Although the Synod of 410 under Isaac indisputedly established the primacy of the See of Seleucia Stesiphon in Persia, the Council nevertheless adopted, adopted a number of liturgical prescriptions in conformity with the usage of the, quote, Western Fathers, or the Awahatha Ma'arwaye. Such liturgical prescriptions included, among other things, the adoption of the Feast of the Nativity of Our Lord as a separate feast on the 25th of Canon, canon the First. Who these Western Fathers exactly were, were remains an enigma to our very day. There have been various conjectures by scholars, but none have been truly conclusive. The Synodicon Orientale mentions the Western Fathers during the course of the first recorded synod, that of Isaac I, as we heard above. The prime representative of that tradition of the Western Fathers has been Marmaruta, the Bishop of Martyropolis, who was thought to have been a su suffragan of the See of Edessa. In fact, it is these Western Fathers who have recognized the primacy of the Catholicos Isaac in the epistle sent to the Persian bishops through the agency of the same Marmaruta. With the Synod of Mardadishu the I in 424, the Catholicate of Seleucia Stesiphon became markedly independent of any relationship with Christianity of the Roman West. In the Markepta of the Arabs, the particular place of the Synod as Seleucia, the Synod of 424 declared that the Catholicus of Seleucia Stesiphon is wholly independent from the, quote, Western Fathers, and that his judgment is reserved to Christ alone, as no appeal could be made by the bishops under his primacy to any of the Western bishops. In classical church history, this has been referred to by some as the so-called Persian schism. 
Dadishu resigned as, reigned as Catholicos of the East from 421 to 456. Upon succeeding his predecessor, predecessor Farabucht, who ruled briefly in 421, Dadishu ascended to the primatial throne of the East at a time marked by Yezdegerd's persecution of Christians, which accompany, accompanied the last year of his reign. The sharp pain of the persecution was still being felt even after Yezdegerd's demise in 420. It must be remembered that during the reign of Bahram V, from 420 to 438, there were campaigns against the Eastern Roman territories on the Western border of the Persian Empire. It was during this animosity with the Roman West that the Synod of Dadishu was convoked. The Catholicos took the position that the Christians of the East, that is, those under Persian rule, were wholly independent of and unanswerable to the hierarchy of the Eastern provinces of the Romans. Furthermore, the primate of the Persian East, who sat in Seleucia Stesiphon, possessed the plenitude of the priesthood and jurisdiction over all of Christendom in the East. <clears throat> The political circumstances of the time were no doubt a decisive factor in this so-called Declaration of Independence by the Church of the East in 424. The Church in the Persian Empire was still emerging out of the great persecution of the East under Shah II, and the temporary persecutions under Yazdegerd I did not help at all either. At the same time, there were constant skirmishes between the Romans and the Persians on the frontier between the two states. This decisive move by Dadishu was, interestingly enough, less theological than political, since the Christological controversies of the West and the subsequent ecumenical councils that dealt with them had not yet fully emerged at this time. The emergence of the primacy of the Catholicos of Seleucia Stesiphon as a, quote, intermediary between the metropolitan rank and the patriarchal one was a theory posited by Aubrey Vine in her 1937 work, The Nestorian Church. That the term Catholicos, as used by the Christians of the Persian Empire, attempted to tie them ecclesiastically to the patriarchate of the Roman West, namely the See of Antioch, as an ecclesiastical go-between, as it were, is an untenable theory today. And I'd like to stress that again. That theory is untenable in church history today. However, Vine states, quote, now the Persians wanted the bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon to be ranked higher than the other metropolitans in Persia. And they also wanted all Persian bishops, ordinary bishops and metropolitans alike to owe their allegiance to the patriarch of Antioch, not directly, but through the bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon. Obviously, this could only be done by interposing a degree between Metropolitan and Patriarch, which they accordingly did by making the Bishop of Seleucia Stesiphon primate of Persia and Catholicos, end quote. The problem with this assertion of Aubrey Vine, however, lies in her underlying premise that the Persian East lay under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Antioch to begin with which was the Christian center of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. This has not altogether been proven. And, and, and in fact, much of the ecclesiastical tradition and the literary evidence, although sparse, disproves this theory. One must remember that the Pentarchy of the Roman West began to be formed and developed since the time of the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea in 325 and was formally completed or crystallized by Chalcedon in 451. The most noteworthy aspect of this development of the primacy in the West was that it did not include the Syriac-speaking East. The whole of Christendom under Persian rule also acquired a parallel primacy in the Persian East in order to disassociate the Christians there from being seen as obedient ecclesiastically speaking, to the Roman West. 
Thus, the theory that the Catholicos of Persia was the link to Antioch, a go-between, as it were, which incidentally was the West with respect to the Church of the East, cannot be seriously sustained by scholars today. The Adishu Synod of Marqabta of 424 was definitively defined, had definitely, definitively defined the primacy and the independence of the Church of the East in Persia in a canonical matter. His synod declared, quote, Easterners shall not complain against their patriarch to the Western patriarchs. Every case that cannot be settled by him shall await the tribunal of Christ, end quote. The primate of the Persian church is now placed officially on a par with the patriarchs of the Roman West and his total authority and jurisdiction over the Eastern Christians is declared. In addition to Aubrey Vine, the well-known Catholic English theologian Adrian Fortescue, in his work, The Lesser Eastern Christ Churches, at the beginning of the 20th century, held the theory that what Dadishu Sina did was effect a division or a schism. <clears throat> in accord with classical Latin Catholic ecclesiology, Fortescue interpre interpreted the acts of the Synod of 424 as causing a schism with the rest of the church. His theory is based on the tenet that, the Seleu that Seleucius de Siphon was previously dependent upon Edessa. And Edessa was a suffragan of Antioch, and Antioch was a subordinate to Rome. His conclusion, therefore, was that in 424, the Church of the East essentially separated itself from Rome, hence the so-called Persian schism. It was also during this synod that the Catholicos of Seleucia Stesiphon was also styled as patriarch, imitating the primates already existing within the Roman West. And of course, again, scholars uh, will not hold this theory today. Fortescue's theory of the so-called Persian schism is enhanced by his understanding that Rome was actually a part of the, quote, Western fathers mentioned in Dadishu Synod, by extension, of course. In essence, according to Fortescue, the decision of 424 by Dadishu and, and the hierarchs with him in the Persian Empire enacted a schism with the see of Rome and its bishop. This Romocentric understanding of communion predating the, 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 great councils, the councils of the great Christological controversies cannot be taken or held seriously in our present understanding of ecclesiology and primacy, as there is absolutely no evidence to indicate that the primatial see of Seleucia Stesiphon was in any ecclesiastical contact or subordinance to the see of Rome, direct or indirect. In 438, the Persian Emperor Yazdegerd II succeeded his father, ushering in another wave of persecution until his death in 457. In the meantime, Dadishu was succeeded by Baboy in 456. His tenure as patriarch came at the close of the pers persecutions of Yazdegerd, and he followed a policy of close relations with the Byzantine Empire. This eventually caused his martyrdom in 485, it is said through the agency of his rival, Barsoma, the Metropolitan of Nisibis, who was an ardent supporter of the Persian monarch and of the diaphysitism that was championed by the school of Nisibis and the followers of the Christological position of Theodore of Mapsuestia. That is only a theory, there is no evidence for that, of course. The theological and political activities of Barsoma of Nisibis helped to definitively distinguish the two branches of the Syriac-speaking churches, namely the Diophysite Church of the East and the Miophysite Syriac Church of Antioch, or the West, Western Syriac Church. At this point, I would like to return to the so-called Western Fathers, mentioned emphatically in the early synods of the Assyrian Church. Who exactly these Western fathers were cannot be said with exactitude or certainty, but their appellation of Western indicates that they were indeed beyond the borders of the Roman of the Persian Empire. 
Many scholars have posited the theory that they were either the bishops of Edessa or possibly the major center of the Roman East, Antioch, etc., and we've heard those. However, the supposed connection between Seleucia Stephan and Antioch has never been solidly demonstrated. Although there are certain writings of the Church of the East that have held this position, such as Pseudo-George of Arbel or the Chronicle of Sers, all of the major canonical works of the Church of the East never mention any ecclesiastical connection or dependence upon the See of Antioch. The following are some of the major reasons for this. First and foremost, Antioch was within the limits of the Roman Empire and served as the capital of the easternmost part of that empire. This was a major factor in the decision of the Synod of 424 to officially declare the independence of the Church of Persia, as it were, from the Roman Christians in the West. Secondly, the culture and language of Antioch was almost exclusively Greek. Granted, the rural environs and villages outside of the city were bilingual, Greek and Syriac speaking, yet Greek still remained the dominant language of the inhabitants. Third, there is no evidence for liturgical borrowing on the part of the Church of the East for, from Antioch. This is most strongly evidenced in the structure of the main anaphora of the Church of the East, namely the apostles Ade and Mari. The structure of the anaphora is unique and it does not follow the classical Antiochian pattern of anaphora. Had this anaphora come to the Church of the East from the Roman West, either Antioch or any other see, at a supposed period of ecclesiastical dependence, as the English Catholic divines of the early 20th century posited, then there certainly would have been traces of that in this most ancient anaphora of the Church of the East. So who exactly were the Western Fathers mentioned by the early canonical literature of the Church and quoted in the ordination rite of the Patriarch of Seleucus Stephan at the beginning of my talk? Although Edessa remains a very plausible theory, we will really never know for certain, as the primary source documents never specify. However, we are certain that the term Western Fathers never indicated Rome or the capital of the Roman Empire and most likely did not indicate Antioch either. Further, all of the Church of the East documents mentioning the letter, or the, the, the quote, letter of the Western Fathers, are posterior to it by a few generations. All we can say is that they were important enough to make mention of twice in the rite of ordination of the Catholicus Patriarch of Seleucia Stephan and they served also as both the canonical and liturgical basis for the consecration of the Catholicus of Seleucia Stephan as patriarch and primate of all the East. I will conclude with a segment from the first consecratory prayer of the patriarchs of Seleucia Stephan, which precedes the one I quoted at the beginning of my talk. Quote, and according, O my Lord, to the apostolic tradition, which has been handed down to us from generation to generation and has come down even unto us by the kiritonia, or the ordination, the laying on of hands of the ecclesiastical ministry, and by the good pleasure and consent of your glorious tr trinity, and by the approval of our excellent fathers of the West, particularly in this church of Kyuche, the mother of all the Orthodox churches entirely. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. I took a second to see my eyes of this. Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, if I could just remind you all just to place your phones on silent to avoid any further distractions. Um, however, now the Assyrian Church of the East is well known for her use of psalms and hymns to praise and worship God, particularly during liturgical services. 
Some information about our first hymn, Ho'ot Norane, is contained in your conference packs. I'd now like to invite Emma Hormuzi and Andre Jamu, choir members at St. Peter and Paul Church, to recite the hymn, Ho'ot Norane.
Thank you, Emma and Andre. That was beautiful. Our next speaker has over 20 tertiary years of teaching experience and is currently an associate professor at Mesebus Assyrian Theological College. I'd like to welcome Proto-Presbyter Dr. Doral Kostaki, parish priest of the Romanian Orthodox Episcopate of Australia and New Zealand to deliver his segment on converging differences in the patristic tradition. Please welcome Proto-Presbyter Dr. Doral Kostaki. Holiness, Ecclesiastes, Gracious, colleagues in the faculty, clergymen, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here. I'm uh, deeply touched. Uh, as we have heard already from His Holiness and uh, previous speakers, the church is a martyr church, and uh, we now live in times where Christians are more and more cornered in the church already. Ours, the Westerners, soon. It's happening everywhere. So I'm really touched, and it means a lot to be in the presence of a glorious history. Now, to sort of lift my spirits a bit, I'll um, just say that uh, I, I, I just returned from Chicago, uh, His Holiness's uh, hometown, where I've been via Zoom this morning at 6.30 at a conference. <laughs> and uh, given uh, my uh, schedule, I had to squeeze in a few things to the extent that uh, even in this talk, uh, I'll um, be reusing some of the stuff that I said there, the uh, North, Patristics, um, uh, North American Patristic Society conference. But uh, with a twist, I develop a few things here that I haven't said there. Now, for many of us, the concept of patristic tradition, which refers to the wisdom of the saintly theologians of the past, evokes divisiveness. And we have heard His Holiness giving us an idea of uh, what divisiveness mean, also disunity. It also evokes what a great theologian of last century, Jaroslav Pelikan, had called logomachy, <laughs> fighting for words, pointlessly and endlessly so. And of course, we cannot ignore the obnoxious conflicts between great theologians of the fourth and the fifth century, such as Jerome, and Rufinus, Theophilus of Alexandria, and John Chrysostom of Constantinople, Augustine and Pelagius, Cyril of Alexandria, and Nestorius of Constantinople, or the same Cyril and Theodoret of Cyrus. All of them wrote much and contributed immensely to the development of the early Christian thought, from theological treatises to scriptural commentaries and from spiritual writings to works of cultural polemic. At times, however, 
They also accused each other of heresy and impiety, causing much turmoil to the churches worldwide. In, some, in the same vein, others took upon themselves to unearth the dry bones, speaking figuratively of those whom they considered causes of trouble for God's people. Not worthy among, uh, among them are Eustatius of Antioch and Epiphanius of Salamis in Cyprus, who wasted no breath in tarnishing origin of Alexandria's name, a man who died a century earlier. Talking about grudge. The same goes for Cyril of Alexandria, who attacked Diodor of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia again, decades late, later after their death. The same goes, moreover, for Ibas or Ihiba of Edessa, who danced for joy together with Theodoret of Cyrus at hearing of Cyril's death, and so on. Up to Emperor Justinian in the sixth century, who fancied himself a theologian and who imposed on the sixth century churches throughout the Roman Empire to hate several Alexandrian, Antiochian, and Assyrian theologians. The harsher words of these personalities of the past poisoned the Christian chalice of communion to this day. With their theological disagreements, proving to have dramatic and lasting outcomes. Just look at the awful spectacle of contemporary Christian disunity, for which they paved the way, which such a merciless, destructive determination. Against this backdrop, is there a point in studying the patristic tradition, the writings of the holy mothers and fathers of old, this question might seem strange coming from me, who am accredited to lecture in patristic studies within the Sydney College of Divinity, including at St. Sibis, also undertaking most of my research in this area. But my question is rhetorical. And in what follows, I shall try to show why I believe it is worth studying the wisdom of the early Christian mothers and fathers of the church. Before that, I must say, however, that in my experience as an academic and a pastor, by the way, I hope that my bishop won't hear that I'm uh, the head of uh, my diocese. I'm with the Romanian church uh, of Australia and New Zealand, but I'm Parish priest. So I have encountered many people who actually disagree with me profoundly. Christians, lay and clergy alike, educated and otherwise, who are of the view that undergoing the study to study the works of past theologians is of no use. This they believe not only because of being convinced that the venerable figures of old should stay buried there in the past, having nothing to teach us, mighty modern people. But also, if not more so, because of the scars the churches still bear on their bodies, so to speak, caused by the ungracious attitude of many great theologians of the past, towards colleagues of other persuasions and backgrounds, especially by the vitriolic discourses. Truth be told, I can understand their concerns to an extent I sympathize with them. The bad, rotten, poisonous fruits of all theological polemics, namely disunity and hatred, warn us Christians about the trees where they grow, that their roots draw on radioactive 
soil. But the patristic tradition is not only about polemics, vitriol, and character assassination. By its prodigiously layered complexity, it also illustrates the wonderful diversity of local and regional Christian cultures, all of which constitute particular embodiments of the one gospel that enrich Greek, Jewish, Latin traditions, and also Armenian, Assyrian, Coptic, Gallican, and Gaelic traditions, to mention only Christianity's oldest expressions. They all have contributed immensely to the enrichment of all. Our ecclesial DNA includes genes specific to each and every one of these ancient Christian traditions. Look at me, for example, a Romanian Orthodox priest, a Westerner. It's the first time I feel a Westerner in my life. <laughs> who treasures the Byzantine tradition, Greek, that is, but who translates it into the Latin-based idiom of his mother, talking to a largely a Syrian audience as a faculty member, actually, of two theological colleges, one Assyrian and one Coptic, that find shelter under the ecumenical umbrella of the Sydney College of Divinity. Appreciating the spirituality of Anthony of Egypt, Columba of Ireland, Ephraim the Great, the Assyrian, John Cassian of Gaul, France, and Maximus the Confessor, a Palestinian Byzantine monk, wearing an Armenian pectoral cross, given to him by a Greek bishop, praising God through doxologies that heavily draw on the Psalms within a worship context whose basic structure still echoes the liturgy of our common Jew Jewish Christian ancestors. I assume that all of us here can point to similar combinations of Christian features pertaining to other cultural horizons than our own. Implicitly, therefore, what we are and represent reveal the tradition's quality for creativity and novelty, integration and inclusion, unity, and fellowship. Many representatives of these early Christian strands of the tradition understood it the way I have showed above, namely as an ongoing opportunity to express the gospel of God's logos, God's word, by way of the particularities and the polychrome beauty of their own culture. I really loved the Assyrian psalm chanted earlier. Ephraim the Great made the point that since the Son of God has put on our body and together with it the garments of names, that is, human languages and cultures, we Christians of many backgrounds must embody his gospel in the possibilities of each and every culture. We must therefore learn from this saint whom we all hold dear, to keep repeating together and in unison his refrain, blessed is he who has appeared to our human race under so many metaphors. That's Sebastian Brock's translation. And the more recent one, blessed is he who has appeared to our humanity in all images. And this wisdom which St. Ephraim expressed so emphatically throughout his hymns on faith, was not wasted on theologians of other traditions. While great creators in their own right, the gentler luminaries of early Christianity borrowed light from others and in turn inspired others. Truth be told, even the theological supernovae that blasted each other with deathly rays of incandescent words 
borrowed from others and each other, but alas, other considerations prevailed. Now let's see a few examples of created exchange between various traditions and their representatives. Take Ephraim himself. Scholars have brought to the fore both his interest as a Syriac writer in Greek literary tropes and sophisticated concepts, and his tremendous impact on Greek writers who, while he was still alive, began to translate his works in their language, or consider the liturgical flexibility of the Assyrian Church of the East, which, according to His Holiness Ma Awa III, has incorporated liturgical elements borrowed from elsewhere, such as the hymn Holy God, even after the great rift of the fifth century between the churches. I found two insightful articles by His Holiness, the memoir of Patriarch Ma Ishoyam, um, the cause of the uh, Holy God, and um, East meets East, Byzantine liturgical influences on the right of the Church of the East. Very informative. And liturgical influence was not one way. It is well documented that a number of Assyrian poets, from Romanos, the Melodist, to John Damascene, John of Damascus, became among the most proficient hymnographers of the Byzantine world, whose liturgical compositions are sung to this day in the Church of My Tradition. Or again, consider monasticism, where exchanges continue to take place for many centuries beyond all ecclesiastical divisions. For example, upon his works being translated into Greek, Isaac of Nineveh has become one of the most influential spiritual authors of the Byzantine Hesychast tradition, where Hesychast is from the Greek word isichia and means serenity or peace. The same Assyrian father has become quite popular in contemporary Coptic Orthodox milieus. For example, being one of the favorite spiritual sources of Patriarch Kyrlos VI. By the same token, Bawai the Great wrote an exquisite commentary on the works of the originous monk Evagrius Ponticus a representative of the Egyptian desert and of Cappadocian theological refinement. Furthermore, Palestinian monks such as John Moscus and Sophronius of Jerusalem transformed the story of an eccentric Alexandrian harlot, Mary of Egypt, into the most inspirational read for Byzantine Christians to the extent that her biography has become a fixture for the Eastern Orthodox experience of Lent to this day. Moreover, upon visiting the East, a very educated Alexandrian merchant and traveler, Cosmas Indikoplevstis, author of a Christian topography, decided to become an Assyrian monk sometime in the 6th century. <laughs> Last but not least, even the theologians of the forefront of doctrinal debates such as Christological ones, which have caused so much pain to God's people, prove to be enough versatile as to borrow concepts from their supposed opponents when further clarifications were needed. So it went, for example, with the Byzantine Chalcedonian theologians who in the sixth century returned to the Christology of Cyril of Alexandria in order to articulate a more comprehensive view of Christ's mystery and who in the 8th and the 9th centuries turned to Antiochian Christology in order to substantiate the theological foundation of icon making and icon veneration. No wonder, therefore, that towards the end of the Byzantine era, the 14th century theologian Gregory Palamas presented an admirable synthesis of theological traditions that at times were understood as divergent. But let me give you an example closer to my area of interest, that is, the way the early Christians perceived reality through the lens of Scripture, foremost the Genesis narrative of creation. Indeed, since the mid-1990s, most of my research has focused on Genesis-related matters as well as early Christian and medieval cosmological ideas. Accordingly, 
In the last part of my talk, I shall consider passages from Basil the Cappadocian Caesarea's homilies on the Eximeron. and John Chrysostom's homilies on Genesis. These are of interest given Basil's reference to an unnamed Assyrian interpreter on the one hand, and John's own geographical and cultural proximity to the Assyrian world as an Antioch-born and bred theologian on the other hand. The scriptural verse which constitutes the object of their analysis is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the earth was a formless void or invisible and unstructured, the way we have it in the Bible of my own tradition. And darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God, or God's spirit in my tradition, swept over the face of the waters. On this note, let me introduce my little case study. While he turned his attention to the Septuagint phrase, the earth was invisible and unstructured, which refers to a chaotic state of the universe, Basil identified two distinct factors at play, respectively the generative capacity of the cosmos and the divine energy that activates creation's potential. In so doing, he referred to what in my book, Humankind and the Cosmos, published last year at Brill, I call the principle of synergy, or cooperation. In Basil's words, due to the latent potentiality stored in it by the demiurge, matter was in painful labor with the generation of all things, waiting for the auspicious times when, by divine call, it could bring out into the open the things engendered within it. The suggestive metaphor of the pregnant chaos awaiting divine word echoes the analogy used by an ancient Greek poet, Hesiod, of the wedding of sky and earth, as well as Philo the Alexandrian's notion of procreative creation, so dubbed by a great Australian scholar, David Runia. Basil deployed the image of the cosmic wedding once again in Hexaimeron to signify the intercourse of the fundamental elements. In his words, through their combining qualities, each receives the aptitude of mixing with the other, and in fact, each through a common quality mixes with its neighboring element, and through the union with that which is near, it combines with its opposite. Basil's world is a dynamic one, where all things interact with all things. Immediately relevant here is that the passage I have quoted a little earlier, speaking of the matter's pregnancy, appears to be the one, the only uh, allusion to God as engaged with the creation in conjugal fashion. Unpacking this metaphor, the masculine principle that is the demiurge or the creator lovingly impregnates the feminine principle that is created matter by storing in it the power or potentiality of the cosmos to be. This is followed by the divine call or activation of creation's maternal or generative capacity. While much more can be said about this passage, suffice it to point out that Basil's image suggests that the universe is the outcome of a continuous interaction between divine and cosmic energies on a fundamental level. Turning to Basil's younger contemporary, John Chrysostom, it is noteworthy that he confirmed the interaction between divine and natural factors within the same scriptural verse. Nevertheless, he focused upon the image of the spirit hovering over the waters, following the Alexandrian translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Most Greek Christian authors refer to the spirit, not the wind. Like Basil, he believed that the chaos of primordial matter signified by the element of water was endowed with a generative potential. Here is the relevant passage. What is being meant by this scriptural utterance, namely the Spirit of God hovered over the water? I am of the opinion that it means this, that the living energy of source was present in the waters. Water was not simply unmoved, it was both moving and endowed with some kind of living power. 
what is static remains wholly useless, whereas what moves is serviceable. John refers here to Basel's principle of synergy, presenting the same dynamic view of the universe. Nevertheless, a couple of differences can be discerned, but I think I should skip this part. What matters is that they share the conviction that the emerging universe came to be ordered through an interaction of divine and natural factors. This should not come as a surprise, given that very possibly John had read Basil's Hexaimeron. His use of Basil's phrase, some kind of living power, confirms it. And so here, the Antiochian theologian, understood by many as a literal interpreter of scripture, borrows from the Cappadocians metaphorical, non-literal understanding of the verse. But let me get to the crux of my case study. When he turns to the spirit hovering over the waters, Basil himself offers a similar interpretation, but by way of a different metaphor, seeking support in the interpretation of the scriptural text by an unnamed Assyrian author. He pictures the spirit as a cosmic agent, which, after the image of a bird hatching the eggs, thoroughly warmed up and enlivened the nature of the waters, warming them from within by some kind of living power. Here, the activity of the spirit appears as a form of radiation which foments the emerging cosmos to the temperature that allows it to develop, thrive, and itself become active. Once that critical temperature is reached, the waters, that is the primordial matter, begins to give birth to the universe's prodigious diversity. It is curious that John Chrysostom who was closer to the Syriac culture, which inspired Basil to use the metaphors, metaphor of the nesting bird, did not use this image. Elsewhere, however, John himself referred to the Syriac version of another, uh, another passage. Either way, their interpretations correspond. John's energized waters are another way of depicting the interactive phenomena signified by the hatched eggs of Basil's Assyrian image. My case study might have detracted your attention from the main thrust of this presentation, which is to bring to the fore creative interactions between representatives of very different early Christian traditions. But I hope that even this example of doing cosmology by way of scriptural interpretation is of some use. At least it's to me, it's my hobby. I also hope, however, that this example supports my proposal that apart from certain theological disagreements between theologians of various cultural backgrounds, the patristic tradition is about being creative while learning from each other. And although Saint Ephraim, in his own exegesis of the same scriptural verse, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, rejected the possibility of taking the wind from God as God's spirit, what matters is that as much as Basil and John were familiar with Syriac theology, he was aware of the strand of interpretation these two Greek authors represented. And so I come to my conclusion. Perceived through examples such as the above, the patristic tradition is not only about logomachy, fighting for words, strident polemics, uncompromising heretic hunting. It displays diversity and unity, converging di uh, differences, uni-diversity. As such, patristic wisdom can help us to rediscover ourselves and one another with our strengths and weaknesses as different yet complementary members of Christ's one body, God's people. Thank you, Proto Presbyter. We'll now have a 10 minute QA session. So, for any of you that do have any questions, uh, please feel free to make your way to the microphone um, and ask any questions 
from Proto Presbyter Dr. Doru Kostaki on his segment today. So if we don't have any questions for today, uh, we will break for lunch. Oh, sorry. A question is about the uh, Shutta. Uh, one of the sources of the uh, Bible uh, in uh, Syriac, old Syriac. Uh, is there any way we can access it? Do we have it? And also, actually, the question is to our patriarch that our church, do we have a copy of original Shutta? Thank you. I have nothing to say about it, Your Holiness. I defer to the experts. Thank you. Yes, of course, we do have the Pshitta in various forms, printed, manuscript. By original Pshitta, we have manuscripts of the Pshitta that go back to possibly 6th, 7th century. Uh, there is the old Syriac version, which goes back to the 5th century. We have manuscripts of that, but nothing older. So by original, we don't have what they call the autographs, meaning what the gospel writers or the sacred authors of the New Testament actually wrote. Those are lost. We have uh, later transcriptions. But the most complete pshutta that we have is from the 800s. That's from the whole New Testament of the pshutta, and it's held in London at the British Library. Did you want to add? Something on the pshat. Maybe just say that we are in the same uh, boat. Oh, you got it. Yeah, you got it. Um, thank you, Your Holiness. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, not a problem that is uh, isolated. We all Christians work by approximation when it comes to the scriptures. The original manuscripts are lost. We have copies after copies after copies. It's true, uh, scholars, modern scholars, and we have to be very grateful for their work. Uh, scholars tried to collate, to bring together information collected from uh, various manuscript traditions, to, but what they come up with is still an approximation. The fact that uh, your church has uh, a manuscript that comes from the 800s is still impressive. Uh, not many churches can say that, or not many other early Christian languages can say that. Uh, I think among the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament uh, in Greek come from the fifth century or so, but they are just two, one in Rome, Vaticanus, and um, the one from Sinai. So it's not easy to, to answer the question, and it's, it's not actually easy to get to the point of the original version. <laughs> At least that's my view. Thank you, Proto Presbyter. Uh, that concludes the first half uh, of the symposium today. Uh, we will uh, be reconvening at 12.55, and we have arranged for a light meal and refreshments outside. Uh, so please feel free to make your way outside after His Holiness and the prelates. Please be standing.
Um, big thank you to Sandy Jammu and the hospitality team for putting out together uh, an amazing spread. Uh, before we reconvene, I do have a few announcements. So a bag was found outside um, in the quadrant. So if you are missing a bag, uh, please see a committee member um, who can uh, return that to you. Secondly, uh, His Holiness's books, uh, The Mysteries of the Kingdom, are still for sale in the lobby. So should you choose to purchase a copy, they are $35. Um, and just lastly, uh, I was told during lunch that many of you did have questions but were afraid to come up to the front uh, to ask your questions. So we're just going to slightly change the logistics of the Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll have one of the committee members uh, come to you with a microphone. Um, and again, please, questions relevant to the topic and directed to the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for the entry of His Holiness and the prelates. Please be seated. Welcome, Dr. Ken Parry. Thank you for joining us today. Our next speaker is currently an injunct instructor at the Pontifical Oriental Institute, facility of Oriental Ecclesiastical Sciences in Rome. He is a lecturer at Nisibus Assyrian Theological College and is the scribe to the Holy Synod. Having traveled all the way from Chicago, Illinois to present today on the general theology of the Assyrian Church of the East, I'd like to welcome Reverend Archdeacon Hashisha William Tuma, parish priest at Morsalikis Parish in Chicago, Illinois. Please welcome Hashisha William Tuma. Your Holiness, 
Marawa III, Catholicus Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, Your Eminence, Your Graces, Reverend Fathers and Deacons, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. My talk today, or my presentation, will be to give an overview or an introduction to the Assyrian Church of the East, just to give you a glimpse about that richness of this tradition by focusing about certain theological themes uh, that has been, some of them controversial, but some of them they were being well studied by many scholars. Theological patrimony is one of the important elements of the identity of any church. The presentation prepares the ground for understanding and appreciation the theological heritage of the Assyrian Church of the East historically known as the Church of the East, by covering the following themes, identifying the main characteristic of her theology, particularly Christology, Mariology, Biblical theology, and Ecclesiology. So the first part will be, what's, what's the importance of studying of the theology of the Church of the East? In the last seven, last several years that has been renewed interest by Western scholars in the recovery of Syriac Christianity. And we can draw several reasons for the importance of the studies of this church. First of all, the importance of Syriac language in itself. Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic and thus an idiom of the language spoken by Christ and those of fishermen, peasants, and tax collectors who gathered to hear Christ speak. And also the tradition of the Church of the East represent to some degree direct hers to the Semitic world, out of which Christianity born. Since Syriac tradition sprang from the Jewish core, his language, vocabulary, thought, categories, and imageries were very related to the Mesopotamian Jews. Thus, Syria Christianity represent a continuous Christian tradition of the new faith of the Messiah that was sprang along the great trade road of the Roman Orient. Secondly, the fundamental characteristic of the Church of the East theology, especially in his early period, is Semitic origin. The Semitic pole is continued from the first centuries of Syriac literature till the end of the 400 AD. The work of the writings of early Syriac writers like Afrahat, Afram, uh, is important because it reflects the thinking of early Christian and pre-Christian and Jewish people that extended back in the Palestine of the first century. Also, the study of this tradition served to shed lights from a new angles on Christian origins, including the books of the New Testament and on the formation of classic Christian doctrine, spirituality, and liturgy. What are the characteristics of this theology? The difference between the Church of East tradition and Western tradition is not only linguistic. Rather, it's basically a difference in theological approach. The Western approach is much more philosophical and analytical while the Semitic approach is much more symbolic and synthetic. These two approaches in theology are not based on differences in the central truths of Christianity, but rather in the different modes of understanding and presenting these truths. They complement rather they contradict each other. The, their theological expression were not made on the basis of conclusion derived from abstract philosophical speculation, as we see in the Latin tradition. But faith was explained using concrete images and thought patterns taken from scripture. In other words, scripture is the fundamental source for Syriac theology. Early Syriac theology and literature were greatly influenced by a specific form of Jewish literature called Haggadah, which is literary narration of stories. For instance, Ephraim used post-biblical Jewish literature, Targumim, which is an Aramaic translation of the Bible, 
and Midrash, which is an exegesis of Torah texts along with the homiletic stories. Syriac fathers use a creative tension between God's grace and righteousness. Also, the Church of the East writers, they focus on the doxological apophatic theology. Doxological is like a right praise by obtaining the knowledge of God through negation. Apophatic is that one. We approach God for negation. Eschatological apocalyptic character and his underlying liturgical and mystical experience are the most important aspects in this theology. They approach divine reality through the eye of faith, not through intellectual scrutiny. Faith is a necessary condition to understand divine revelation in nature, scripture, and in the person of Christ. Ephraim views theology not so much as a faith-seeking understanding as we see it in the Latin tradition, because he is all too aware of the fragility of real understanding of the elusive reality of God but as faith adoring mystery, reaching out through the limited understanding to adoring in silence the mystery of God is. Ephraim applies that real knowledge of self is the prerequisite for any knowledge of God. If real knowledge of God is sought, it will be found in God's revelation of himself in the person of Jesus. The Christology of the Assyrian Church of the East. The ancient Christian tradition looked with suspicious on the Christological faith that the Church of the East has traditionally confessed, the methodology that she had used, and the teaching that she has taught. It may be because of that the Assyrian Church was misunderstood in the history by Christians. For Syriac tradition, incarnation and soteriology, soteriology means the saving works of Christ, are intrinsically related to each other. Incarnation is the high point of, the, of their soteriology, which is built around the imagery of clothing. From creation to fall, through incarnation to the sacraments, and on to the final resurrection is graphically and cohesively presented through the image of robe of glory. The Christology of the Church of the East followed the Antiochian school of theology, influenced by Aristotelian philosophy. It emphasized on the historic and concrete and literal interpretation of the scripture. The theology of this church were committed to the theology of two natures initiated from the Senate of Mar'aqa 486 and the subsequent Senates. But our faith in the dispensation of Christ should also be in confession of two natures of Godhead and manhood. None of us venturing to introduce mixture, commingling, and confusion into distinction of these two natures. Following the Antiochian school, they described Christology in terms of emphasizing on the reality of Christ's historical humanness. And necessary elements in this approach was to establish a distinction of the terminological level, which emphasized the concrete, substantial reality of both Christ's divinity and humanity. According to the Christology of the Church of the East, there are two natures, which we call it in Syria, kiane, two qnume, and one person. So we need to understand what the writers of the Church of the East actually meant when they used these technical terms, rather than rely on what their opponents meant, claim what they meant. What do we mean by kiana? The word kiana can be translated into Greek as pieces and conventionally translated nature. In the fourth and the fifth century translation from Greek, it is significant that kiana sometimes renders usia, 
as well as feces. Usia ile, how to say, is like usiyaya uh, jawhar. The same phenomena can be seen in the Syriac translation of the term homoousios, found in the creed as bar kiana. So kiana can be defined as which designs the common element or designates the common elements found in all members of species. Normally, kiana is general, abstract, inclusive, compared to the particular singular, which we call Uma. So when we speak about humanity, it's, we are speaking about Kiana. Why? Because humanity is, when you think about the concept of humanity, this is an abstract sense. It's something general. You are not making it specific on the person. So Kiana is on the level of much more on the abstract aspect. Isha'iyab the th second Gdalaya in the seventh century calls it kiana as kiana gawanaya, a universal essence which is existing in the intellect like an image having no object to qualify. Onuma is the particular instance of kiana. It's an individuated nature opposed to common nature. Qnuma is much more to say contricization of the abstract kiana, such as this kiana or that kiana. And when we speak about nature, humanity is much more abstract, and Qnuma is much more you specify it, you make it particular. You say this kiana or that. So it's much more you reduce it to the person. Hence, it's the individual instance of kiana, it's the reality of it. If one speaks in abstract human nature, kiana is appropriate because kiana describes humanity as a whole. But if I speak something as being human, it must have a knuma or it does not exist. Bawe the Great who died in 628, speaks of two natures with their knuma. In few words, it would be seen that for Bawai, whereas kiana is generic and virtues on the sense of usia, which means usia, it means also essence, knuma prefers as an individual, though not necessarily self-existent, manifestation of kiana. Qnuma is indifferentiated in any way from other Qnuma. So if we have two person and they have two Qnuma, both of them are similar because both of them are an exemplary or instance of that general Kiana. So if we say Peter and Qnuma of Peter, uh, Qnuma of Paul, they are similar because they have a rational soul, immortal soul and mortal body. On that essence, the knuma of A is similar to knuma of B. Now we will come to the, another third terminology, parsupa, prosopon. For the Church of the East, prosupa is the sum of characteristic internal and external and distinguish one knuma from another. So if we say Gnuma of Peter, Gnuma of Paul are similar because both of them, they have a rational soul, a mortal uh, soul and mortal body, but also Gnuma of Peter, Gnuma of Paul will be distinction or different through their parsupa. So the parsupa are the elements to differentiate one Gnuma from another. Paul does not only look different from Peter, what we mean by hair and color, height and weight, complexion. Here we are speaking about parsupa. But acts differently, reflecting underlying differences in abilities, talent, and interests. The characteristic of parsupa, we are talking here. 
Paul becomes the subject of interest on his own, not just as specimen of manhood. An integrity of his identity is bound up in the fact of his parsupa, is uniquely his and not others. Now we will come, what is the subject of that person? And another question, in another way, what would be the agent, the human experience, the acts of Jesus Christ? Because what we were accused by stating to Qnuma in Jesus, people they thought we are saying there are two persons in Jesus. Or to Qnuma in Jesus, that means he has two subjects, two acts. One time he is acting as a human, so like a different person. Another time there he has another person inside him, he is acting as God. He is not one person. That's what we were accused. So the question is, what is the subject? Who is the subject of a person named Jesus Christ? According to the Church of the East teaching, the manhood which was fashioned by the Holy Spirit from the material of the Virgin Mary's womb was for the express and only purpose of receiving the incarnation of the Word and to, and at no time possess an independent existence. Babai say, thus, it's incumbent up to us to understand that with the voice of the angel who said, the Holy Spirit shall come and the power of the Most High shall rest upon you, immediately with sound at that moment was taken. So the pneuma of manhood of Christ was served only as the vehicle of God's redemption acts. It has no existence apart from his union with God the Word, which took place, as Bawai says, that, beginning quote, that God the Word might be revealed in it and fulfill all his dispensation in it and show thought its beginning of the new age and in it, be worshipped forever. Why Bawai is em emphasizing on that? Because they were attacking the Church of the East by saying that Mary delivered a man named Jesus, and then he received his adoption. <laughs> he received his divinity. What Bawai wants to say, at the time of conception, the two natures come under one subject, that who is divine person. We read, I'm giving some quote from our synodical documents, proving that the Church of the East believing on one subject, one agent of operation. Synod of Isha'iah 587 says, the Son of God, God the Word, Light from light descended and became incarnate and became man by the way of economy beyond alteration of change. So the word of God is the subject here. Ishayab letter to Jacob says this, God the word accepted the insult of suffering in the temple of his body economically in a perfect union without separation Though in the nature of his Godhead he did not suffer, as our life giver said, destroy this temple, and after three days I will raise it up. John 2.21. All what we see here, that there are no plural subjects in the mind of Bawai or in those of his fellow writers. There is one son of God, takes his own flesh, not another's, from the Blessed Virgin. The double consubstantiality and double birth of the Son of God, God the Word, light from light, with the Father from whom he was begotten naturally, and with Mary from who he was begotten in the flesh, our humanity is thus affirmed. The question is, why did Jesus lack the parsupa of human filiation? So when we say he is, has one person and the subject of that person is the divine person, then why he's lacking the person of manhood? He has a knuma of manhood, 
He has a Kiana Nashaya, human nature, but he is lacking the person of manhood. There is no time because, a reply to this, because there was no time when Jesus was not the Son of God. Since the pursuit of the divine filiation was received by his humanity, and at the moment of conception became the only one subject. The human gnuma did not in any time exist apart from the union with the farsufa of divine filiation of the Son of God. In Christ, therefore, there are two gnuma, divine and human, both of which possess same farsufa identity of divine filiation but both of which are integrally preserved in the characteristics inherent in the proper of their natures. What was the reason that the ancient Christian tradition looked with suspicious on the Christology of the Church of the East? We need to be aware that several of the key terms used in the Chalcedonian definition meant rather different things or different people and at different times. Further complication introduced when these terms are translated into another language, in our case is Syriac, and when advances in translation techniques over the course of time. In the early Christian writings, the term hypostasis in Greek was used to donate usia, essence, substantia, substance. It was used in this way by Tatian, Tatianus, and Origen, and especially in the anathemas appended to the Nicene Creed 325, where the term hypostasis was meant to be substance where it says, quoting, anyone who asserts that the Son of God is in different hypostasis or substance or created or is subject to alteration or change, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. Even in the Latin version of that anathema, it tried to say, vel axia substantia. So it's here, hypostasis is much more translated by around fourth century, in the first half of the fourth century, as nature, as substance. But when we come at the Council of Chalcedon 451, the term hypostasis was shifted, the connotation of the term hypostasis was shifted from nature to the persupa, to the person. While the Church of the East maintained the archaic terminology of hypostasis, which we meant was much more in the side of nature rather than on the side of what? Of persupa. In the Christology definition in the Chalcedonian, they say two natures and one hypostasic union. While for us, when we say tuknuma, which is somehow equivalent to hypostasis, they consider us, we are saying two parsupa. But we maintain the old archaic terminology, meaning connotation of hypostasis as a nature rather than as a parsupa, but they misunderstood us and they try, they judged us from their point of view, from their lenses. They didn't take in consideration that we did not adopt the new in the translation of hypostasis that was developed in the West while it was maintained the same old archaic way. That's one of the reasons, really, which I don't want to go through others due to the time. We'll try to be briefly as much as we can. In conclusion on the theme of Christology, just I want to say this. The Assyrian Church of the East teach that Jesus Christ is truly perfect God and perfect man. The differences between the Christology of Antioch and Alexandria lies in the fact that one tradition emphasizes the duality of nature, while the other emphasizes the unity of person in Jesus Christ. Instead of considering these two schools 
Antiochian, and Alexandrian. As holding opposite view on Christology, it is best to see them as complementary to each other. In the Christological declaration between the Assyrian Church of the East with the Roman Catholic Church in 1994, we read the following. This is the unique faith that we profess in the mystery of Christ. The controversies of the pad led to anathemas, earning on person and on formulas. The Lord's Spirit permits us to understand better today that the division brought about in this way were due to enlarge far too misunderstanding. And this is the reality what happened in the around fourth and fifth century. Regarding the Mariology of the Church of the East, how many time do I have? <laughs> okay. All the Marian doctrine and titles are Christological in purpose. They were meant to draw our attention to Christ. This is the privilege of Mary as derived from her special relationship to Christ as a mother. She conceived him by the power of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to him, hence his flesh is from her flesh. The Church of the East holds Mary in esteemed honor, aimed the saint as it venerates her remarkably through her devotions and memorials. However, she is never worshipped as some Christian have claimed. The church has set three liturgical commemorative days of the Blessed Virgin in the liturgical year. First one is the second Friday of Nativity, is the first sanctoral commemoration cycle in the liturgical year. It's connected with the Nativity of Jesus' cycle of peace. It was most likely incorporated in the liturgical calendar of the Church of the East around 5th century, after officially adopting the Feast of Nativity. The first evidence of adopting the Feast of Nativity that we have is found in the Canon 13 of the Senate of Mar Ishaq 410. This holiday is celebrated in honoring Mary for giving birth to Jesus Christ. The second feast is May 15, is also referred to as Protectoress of Harvest, not Radzara. It was most likely designed or designated for the rural areas in which the church invoked the intercessions of Mary to ask the Lord for the blessed harvest since it's associated with the blessing of the harvest and crops. And the third feast is August 15, which is the Dormition of Mary. The commemoration of Mary's falling asleep is preceded with two weeks of fasting. The fasting period is done to ask for her intercessions. It begins August 1st and ends August 15th. In every liturgical celebration, whether in the divine offices or Holy Eucharist, a special hymns of prayer is designated to her. Hence, her name is repeated in church prayers of the day or of the night. The Church of the East uses the title Christotokos, which means Mother of Christ, our Lord and our God. By calling Mary Mother of Christ is not den denying the divinity of Christ, nor the descent of divine word who is the same King of Ages and the Holy Mother of Christ. The term Christotokos is indicative title inclusive humanity and divinity. Quoting by, by the great, God the Word is consubstantial with the Father, and because of the union Blessed Mary is called Mother of God and Mother of Man. Mother of Man according to her own nature, but Mother of God because of the union which he had with his humanity, which was his temple at the beginning of his passion and was begotten union. And he's continuing. Because the name Christ 
is indicative of both natures in the hypostatic state of his God, the world, Godhead and his humanity. The scriptures say that the Blessed Mary bore Christ and simply is God in a disunite way and not simply man and taken by God word. So what Bawe is saying, we are calling Christ mother of Christ because is that, that title is already in the scripture. So we are much more basing on the scripture rules. The secondly, Christ is enough because that in, inclusive both of them, the humanity of Christ and divinity of Christ. We don't want to call her mother of God and then we try to qualify that she is her mother according to his humanity. When we say Christ, mother of Christ, that will be more than enough and at least it is much to have a biblical or uh, roots. The Marian doctrine of devotions have flourished from the patristic era of the second century. However, the Mariology of the Church of the East correlates with the theology of dispensation of Christ Hence, East Syriac Mariology is preserved as a Christology, Soteriology, Anthropology, Ecclesiology, Nomentology. There are many themes, many typology way they use it in the, for Mary. Like she is ever virgin, perpetual virginity, Mary as a second Eve. There is a typology of tree of life, and also she is a bride as a church. Bride of Christ. Speaking about biblical theology, early Syriac theologian approach scripture and their interpretation of the biblical text is both spiritual and practical. They regard scripture as the incarnation of God human language. They emphasize the spiritual exegesis which proceeds from faith. The inner meaning of scripture can only proceed by the inner eye of faith. Syriac theologian greatly influenced by thought patterns of scripture. They use a typo typological approach. And typology was used not just as a method to interpret scripture, but as the main vehicle, vehicle of doing theology. For these writers, types and antitypes were not only indicators of the plan of salvation, but became the means by which to understand how salvation and divinization would be achieved. Typology is an interpretive principle, is the study of biblical types. And types are a divine analogy of a new covenant, which is anti-type, found in the old covenant, which is type. While analogy is something that we use in comparison, it has profound similarities and dissimilarities. So when we do an analogy between A and B, we try to find what are the similarities and what are the dissimilarities between them. So the type in the old covenant in itself is a historical reality, but is also represent, representative of something greater. In the Church of the East, the study of prayerful consideration of biblical types is called typology. For example, Adam, Jesus typology. In St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians and Romans, we see, Early Christians understood that the Old Testament was full of types or pictures that were fulfilled or realized in the New Testament. Just give you one example. Moses prefigured Christ, though Moses himself was a man. The Menna prefigured the Eucharist, though Menna in itself was a miracle. And we have also typology of Adam, Jesus, first Adam and second Adam. Both they were male, both they were born, but there are differences. Adam sinned, Jesus never sinned. Adam died, but never was risen, but Jesus died and was risen. So here we are doing a typology. So that's the method that they use in explaining the scripture. 
Finally, the ecclesiology of the Church of this East is caught in a typological and symbolic language than providing a systematic and coherent presentation of the nature of the church. The father of the church have a sacramental and soteriological understanding of the mystery of the church, the focal point of the divine dispensation in Christ even. Christ, though his baptism, death, and resurrection achieved salvation and established the church as the locus par excellence of his experience. The church as the type of future kingdom is the vehicle of this salvation and prepares her children to receive the fullness of salvation, the eschaton, through the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. The Syriac Father did not, do not give a required importance for life of the church in this world, the strong ascetical and scatological bent of mind of our authors must have contributed to a weaker sense of the church as entity in this world. The Syriac ecclesial tradition has a great ecumenical value. Here I'm concluding the paragraph on ecclesiology. The Semitic wing of Christianity, the Syriac tradition, belonged to the undivided heritage of the universal church. As such, it is to be regarded as the common patrimony of all ecclesial traditions and has a strong ecumenical import in the present scenario of the, of the divided churches. In fact, the unity of church is a recurring theme in the liturgical tradition of the church. Saint Ephraim compares the unity of the church to the seamless undivided tunic of Christ, the tunic being the symbol of true and undivided faith handed over by the apostles. Conclusion. The aim of this presentation was to give more salient features of the rich theological tradition of the Church of the East. Although Christian theology has often been divided quite simply into Latin speaking West and the Greek speaking East. However, that does not do justice on the most important components of Christian theology taken holistically Coming out of the rich biblical and Semitic backgrounds, the theology of the Church of the East has much to offer in the discipline of theology. Without his presence and without being thoroughly studied and adequately understood, conventionally theology will not be truly comprehensive nor representative of the various apostolic churches and their ancient tradition. It is my sincere hope that the various aspects of theology of the Church of the East will be studied by her faithful and scholars alike with an open and receptive mind in order to truly delve into the depths and richness of one of the most important Syriac-speaking churches. I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. thank you. Session. So for any of you that do have questions, um, put your hand up. I'm happy to come to you with the microphone and we can ask Ravi some questions. Again, questions, not statements, directed to Ravi and his topic. Hello, I want to thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, for uh, some disclosure, I am from the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church, but uh, it's really wonderful to hear your theology, your Christology, and your faith expressed in your own terms and not in terms that are imposed uh, upon you by outsiders like us. <laughs> so it's, uh, we really do appreciate that, and we're very happy to have um, uh, Nisbus College as well, part of the Sydney College of Divinity. I think it's, it's uh, going to be wonderful for the relations between us uh, churches who, who exist in, in, in uh, the difficult conditions within the Middle East. 
Um, my question is really more out of curiosity. Uh, so in terms of the, the, the uh, uh, Kliana and uh, Khnume and the way that that was applied in a Christological setting, what is the Syrian Church of the East's use of that terminology in a Trinitarian setting? Knuma was used for the first time really by Ephraim also he used it when he said three Knumas in Trinity. It's similar to what uh, Basil of Caesarea when he speaks about the idea, when he tried to distinguish between idea and particular. So he said the idea is like when we are speaking about usia, in particular when we speak about hypostasis. Nevertheless, later on they take it more as an hypostasis going to the person rather than to the particular nature or particular substance. Also for the Church of the East, Pneuma of the Trinity is like in the divine part communication, uh, as like the Pneuma of the Father, as a unique communication of the divine essence. It's, that's why we have a divine essence, one divine essence in Trinity, which is the usia, and that a unique communication of the divine essence of, uh, of God, that's what we call it the Father. So it's much more particularity, distinct and relation, but not in three hypostases, like three, we have a three gods. They are distinct and relation, but not in separation, like a three hypostasis in separation. So it's similar, like it's much more on particularity of the divine essence, but it's by in relationship father to the world, we say he is the creator. We say it in uh, the begotter, the yaluda, the son is ilida, that the one is being born, and the process, procession for the Holy Spirit. And also in relation to the world, the Father, Creator, the Son is the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit is the Sanctifier. But doesn't mean they do all as one God, but always is distinguish the particularity for each of the Knuma uh, of them. But all of them, they try to communicate the divine essence as in particular way. So that really, Knuma, I, this is my personal idea, I think Knuma has been taken from what uh, Basil has started to distinguish between usia and hypostasis, the idea and the particular. But uh, when you make it a person, then you make it as a separate one. But for us, not necessarily to be, have self-existence as a person. Still exist, but not to, to be seen through persona, which we call it prosopa. Hello, thank you very much. Shamasha Philip from Melbourne. Um, it is easy to understand that there can be misunderstanding or interpretation 600, 700 years ago. But today that we're clarifying all these things, what is the current counter argument to our clarifications for the misunderstanding by sister churches? I mean, the dialogue has started, I mean, it's not very fast, slowly. I mean, already has started the dialogue, Assyrian Church of these with the Roman Catholic Church, and already two declarations has been signed, the one on Christology 94, and the one on sacramental life on 2017. We are having a dialogue with the Russian Orthodox Church uh, on certain themes that we are discussing. Still we need time, really. Maybe the Assyrian Church of the East needs to present itself, her theology more publicly, more such symposium to bring more people attention. Uh, our website should be more clear and to have all set of theological expression, because sometimes maybe from other churches they are seeing 
different interpretation, and then might be they will judge us uh, also. Also, from the other side, maybe they are putting too much prerequisite prior to have a dialogue, like to anatomize certain persons that they, they though they were not a member of our church, but we never have uh, anatomized it. They, we consider them their uh, theology was orthodox. Like with the Catholic, they didn't put us a prerequisite to have a dialogue. They say, let's sit together around one table and six, submit your uh, theology through your patristic and through your uh, dogmatic and your canonical documents, and we will do the same, and let's reach to that declaration. But certain churches, maybe they need to anatomize certain personage before to sit around table, and that will be difficult because we will not be faithful to our heritage and, uh, and the history of our church. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Again, I'd like to invite Emma and Andre to perform the hymn titled Bruchanana. Some information about this hymn is contained in your conference packs. Please welcome Emma and Andre.
Thank you again, Emma and Andre. Our final speaker for today is a senior lecturer, honorary senior research fellow in the Department of History and Archaeology at Macquarie University, and is a world-renowned authority on ancient missionary works of the Church of the East in Central Asia and China. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ken Parry. We could put the lights down a little bit. Would you might see the slides better with the lights down or not? I'm not sure. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to first say thank you for all coming today. It's a fantastic audience, but I really need to thank the college for inviting me today. I need to also to thank the His Holiness Ma'ava. Um, Milis as well for inviting me today. It's a great honor to be here. I'm going to be talking more on the historical side rather than the theological side, but I am a theologian as well. Um, so let's see what we can say about the patriarch of the Church of the East in Central Asia and China. The evidence for the early history of Christianity in China comes from two periods. Can you hear me all right? It's a 
during the Tang Dynasty, that is from the 7th through to the 10th century, and the Yuan Dynasty from the 13th into the late 14th century. The first being a Chinese dynasty and the second a foreign one under the Mongols. It was due to the overland trade route known as the Silk Road from the Middle East through Central Asia that allowed Christianity to reach China under the Tang. The Silk Road also played a role in the later transmission of Christianity to China under the Mongols. Only by this time there was an additional trading route by sea from the Middle East to South China. It would be a mistake to think that the presence of the Church of the East in these regions was part of a concerted effort to evangelize. When the evidence suggests that it was there to serve local communities of foreigners, with indigenous believers being most, most likely the result of intermarriage. What it shows is that the Church had sufficient organizational ability to administer to some degree these remote communities and to appoint bishops where necessary. This is seen by the fact that the bishops in Central Asia and China were excused regular attendance at church synods and were allowed to submit letters every six years informing the Catholicos Patriarch of the situation in their diocese. As we shall see, there is a missing link in our knowledge of what happened to Christianity in China in the period between the two dynasties of the Tang and the Yuan. So we'll say something first about the Tang dynasty. The presence of Christians in China by the seventh century was first recognized a thousand years later in 1625 when a notable discovery was identified by the Jesuits. This was the stele dated 781 from the Tang capital of Xi'an. The impact of this discovery took a long time to register among historians of Christianity in China, due in part to the controversy over its genuineness. It came as a surprise to learn that the branch of the Christian church, the East Syriac Church, erroneously called the Nestorian Church, and known today as the Assyrian Church of the East, had not only reached China during the Tang Dynasty, but had received imperial recognition and support. This and much more was documented on the Xi'an bilingual inscription in Chinese and Syriac, the section in Estrangular script listing 70 names of local monks and clergy. Significantly, the stele records the arrival of Christians in China in 635, as well as an imperial edict issued in 638, granting them permission to practice their religion. This edict informs us that 21 monks were ordained, that they prayed towards the east, grew beards, practiced poverty and fasting, struck a wooden board calling the monks to prayer seven times a day, and celebrated the liturgy every Sunday. Thus, the inscription recounts the status and history of the Church of the East in China during approximately its first 150 years. In addition to the inscription itself, the stele has important iconographic features representing for the first time the cross on the lotus flower indicating quite clearly Buddhist influence. This can be seen at the top of the monument above the panel inscribed with nine Chinese characters proclaiming, let's see if we can get on to it. Sorry. Can you see that? How clear is it? Is it clear enough? So on the left-hand side, we have this stele, which you can see today if you visit Xi'an. Um, it's not very clear from the photograph because it's covered with a, a plastic um, um, cover to protect it. But this is the famous stele here on the left. And on the right, is the top part with the characters, Chinese characters, which say, says, Steely celebrating the diffusion of the luminous religion of Da Qin, which means the Roman Empire, in the Middle Kingdom, that is China. So this is very good evidence for the presence of the Church of the East in China by this time. 
There you can see uh, it'll, the Chinese characters a little bit more clearly. And also you can see the cross on the lotus flower and also uh, surrounded by some flowers or some cloud designs. And you can see it more clearly on the right. So who were these Christians and where did they come from? Most came from Persia and Central Asia and spoke an Iranian language called Sogdian, the lingua franca of the ancient overland trade route between Byzantium and China. This was spoken in an area of Central Asia called Sogdiana, known to the Greeks through the conquests of Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC, which today covers parts of Uzbekistan and other neighboring states. Christians were identified on the Xi'an monument from the Chinese term Jingzhao, which means religion of light or the luminous religion. But it might also mean the religion of those who fear God. But I'll come back to this term in a minute. They were also identified from the name of Ma Hanishu, which was believed to be the name of the patriarch of the Church of the East when the inscription was composed in 781. The dating is according to the Seleucid calendar or the year of the Greeks, a calendar adopted in 312 BC by Hellenized states in the wake of Alexander the Great's empire. It continued to be used by the Church of the East and is found on Christian tombstones in Central Asia as well as in China. So if you're not sure where Sogdiana is, you can see it on the map. This is ancient Sogdiana. And on the other side, you can see some Sogdians from a tomb uh, unearthed in China. You can see that their dress is very distinctive uh, in this way. And some possible Christians, Sogdian Christians from Central Asia. If you look at their faces, you can see that some of them are quite Western and some are quite... Han Chinese. So it's an indication of this mixture that's beginning to happen in this period from about the 6th, 7th, 8th century into the early Tang period. This is in Central Asia, not in China, in Xinjiang province. Further evidence for Sogdian speaking Christians in China came from an octagonal pillar discovered in 200, sorry, 2006 at Luoyang, the second capital of the Tang dynasty and dated 815. In addition to its Chinese inscription, it had further iconographic details not seen on the Xi'an stele. The Loan pillow is not, pillar is not only confirmed a community of Sogdian Christians living in that city, but listed the names of Christian monks and their Sogdian origins from the region of Bukhara and Samarkand, which is in Uzbekistan today. The Chinese terms used for clergy and monastics were borrowed largely from Buddhism to represent Syriac ecclesiastical titles in the cultural context of Tang China. It indicates quite clearly a process of sinicization also found in some Chinese Christian literature from the period. Sogdian merchants and their communities were settled along the Silk Road are known to have followed several other religions, namely Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, and Buddhism, besides Christianity. The Christians in China were thought to be Persians, is shown by an imperial edict of 754, changing the name of their community from Bozi Zhao, meaning the Persian religion. Bozi means, in Chinese, means Persia, the name of Persia, to Da Qin meaning the Great Qin, the old Chinese name for the Roman Empire, and found on the Xi'an stele of 781. The reason for this change of title was probably related to the fall of the Sasanian Empire in Persia in 651, and the need for Christians to distance themselves from the Arab Muslim conquest of Persia especially after the Chinese army was defeated a hundred years later at the, by the Arabs at the Battle of Talis in 751. That's probably in uh, Kyrgyzstan today. 
it was naturally prudent for Christians in China to disassociate themselves from the Abbasid Caliphate based at Baghdad, although the Patriarch of the Church of the East, Ma Timothy, moved the Patriarchate from Seleucia Satisiphon to Baghdad on his election in 780. The Patriarch Timothy I is an important if controversial figure in the history of East Syriac Christianity. He not only encouraged intellectual pursuits such as the translation of Greek texts into Syriac, but he is well known for the interfaith dialogue that took place between himself and the Caliph al-Mahdi. The subsequent role of East Syriac Christians in the translation of Greek philosophical and medical works into Arabic at Baghdad owes much to his initiative. He also appointed bishops to Central Asia and China, as well as to India and Tibet. His own appointment was not without controversy, however, because he was opposed by several metropolitans, one of whom, Joseph of Mur, in today's Turkmenistan, appealed to the caliph and on being rejected, converted to Islam. The controversy caused rioting by Christians in the streets of Baghdad. I'm sure that's not going to happen for the 122nd uh, Catholicos Patriarch in the streets of Sydney today. But, yeah. The Patriarch Ma Abba in the 6th century is said to have sent a bishop to the area of the Oxus Ridge River in Bactria, which is in now Afghanistan. By middle of the same century, Samarkand had become a center of the Church of the East, with archaeological evidence from the area revealing several Christian structures as well as stone inscriptions. Christian texts found in Central Asia and China are written in a variety of scripts and languages. The most important of these are in Syriac, Sogdian, and Chinese, with fragments in Middle Persian. The texts in Chinese show that attempts were made to explain Christianity to Chinese speakers who had some familiarity with Buddhist terminology. The Christian Sogdian texts are mainly translations into Sog Sogdian of already existing Syriac texts, but which in some cases have not been identified. The Sogdian term Tarsak was the usual one for Christians in Persia and Central Asia probably derived from those who fear, as in English, God-fearer, familiar, of course, from the New Testament. Although the Xi'an Stele uses the term Jing Zhao for Christians, meaning those who have followed the luminous religion, it has been suggested that it could mean the religion of those who fear God, which is probably a nearer interpretation uh, to what they were trying to express in the Chinese in this period, 7th century. The term luminous religion was not confined to Christianity, but was also used of Buddhism and Manichaeism in China. So it might not distinguish qu Christians from the others. The so-called kingdom of Tars, found in medieval Western texts and on maps, was associated with Tartary, a common name for Central Asia which is a name that's probably familiar to us in a Western context. But it may be related to this notion of Tarsa. It is important to note that we do not find the term Nestorian being used for or by Christians in Central Asia or China, with the term being found most often in Western sources and often in a polemical context. Nostorius, who was disposed as Bishop of Constantinople in 431, never went to Persia and never established a church of his own. He spent the last 16 years of his life in exile in Egypt and died there in 451. It is of interest that Syriac sources indicate that he was buried at Panopolis, modern Akmim, on the Nile, and that pilgrims venerated his tomb there. There are references to communities from the Church of the East, as well as the appointment of a bishop to Egypt. Nestorius was celebrated in the Church of the East as one of the three Greek doctors, along with Diodore of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia. He can, continues to be remembered as an Antiochene father through a Eucharistic anaphora used in the church today. It was at the end of the Tang Dynasty and in reaction against the presence of foreigners 
that the imperial authorities issued an edict in 845 banning all Western religions, including Christianity. The edict refers to some 3,000 Dachin monks to lay life, returning them to lay life, and in 878, an Arab traveler reports that Christians in Canton, in South China, had been massacred. These events seem to have resulted in the disappearance of Christianity from China for approximately 400 years, until its reappearance under the Mongols. There is mention by the Muslim scholar Al-Nadim of a Christian monk from Arabia who made a journey in 987 to China to see what had happened to the Christians, but who reported that he had found not one. However, in such an enormous country, he may easily have missed them, especially if they were assimilated or went underground. If the connection between Christianity in the Tang and in the Yunnan period cannot be established from documentary evidence, then it can from iconography. The Luan pillar of 815 shows the iconographic connection between them, excuse me, in the representation of the cross on the lotus between two angels. This is replicated on Christian tombstones in China under the Mongols, showing that the Church of the East hung on to its identity in the intervening years. This is this uh, recent pillar that was found in 2006. Um, you can see it's an octagonal pi pillar. It has an inscription in Chinese, which you can't read very clearly on this picture. But please notice the iconography, because you have angels either side, and in the middle you have again the cross <clears throat> on the lotus flower. So what this does in the Tang period is establish this sort of image of the cross on the lotus flower with two angels either side of it, and we don't see it again until the Mongol period. But it shows that there is continuity between those two dynasties um, in China. So let's turn to the Mongol period. We do not know how many Christians lived in Central Asia and China during the Pax Mongolica, but the fact that the Mongols included Christians in the Commission for the Promotion of Religions in 1289 gives some indication of their status. This office supervised the affairs of not only Christians, but other religious communities as well, such as Muslims and Manichaeans. With the conquest of China by Kublai Khan in 1271, the Mongols adhered mainly to their traditional steppe religion or to Buddhism. However, there was a sizable community of Christians among them, including Kublai Khan's mother and wives of officials at the Mongol court. Foreign travelers to China, such as William of Rubuk and Marco Polo, comment on the influence of the Church of the East on the leading Mongol officials and their families. In the Chinese history of the Yuan dynasty, mention is made of one Jesus the Christian and interpreter, who was appointed head of astronomy and medicine in 1263. He was sent on an embassy to Persia in 1285, and on his, on his return in 1291, was appointed head of the Commission for the Promotion of Religions. One of his sons succeeded him as head of the Commission on his death in 1308. Christian in China, Christians in China during the Yang Dynasty um, therefore enjoyed considerable high-powered positions as officials in the uh, Yuan Dynasty in China. It is of interest that the Mongol Ilkhans in Persia attempted to make an alliance with the European powers when they dispatched Raman Sama on a diplomatic mission in 1286. Raman Sama was a Christian monk from Beijing who with his disciple Marcus had set out on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1275. Both were from the Onguk tribe in Inner Mongolia which became part of the Mongol Federation under Genghis Khan. This is in the late um, 12th, early 13th centuries. Discoveries in the region of Inner Mongolia have re revealed bronze crosses and tombstones with a variety of motifs, including the cross on the lotus, clearly indicating a Christian presence. 
The story of their journey, preserved in a Syriac manuscript, provides evidence for Christians among the Central Asian peoples as they lodged with them on their journey to the West. Most of them would have been Turkic-speaking like themselves. In 1281, Marcus was elected Catholicos of the Church of the East as Mar Yab Alaha III, while Rabban Salma's diplomatic mission took him to Constantinople, Rome, and France, where he met the French and the English kings. It's an amazing journey that these um, these two had made all the way from China, and um, the fact that Rabban Salma went all the way to France and spoke with the English and French kings. It's quite remarkable for a Christian from China who made this journey. His mission was a failure as far as securing an alliance with the European powers was concerned, but his story is one of the few to detail the journey from eastern to west at that time. The election of Marcus as patriarch shows the Church of the East appointing someone who was trusted by the Mongols and who could speak directly to court officials. However, according to the Syrian Orthodox bishop and scholar, Bar Habreus, who knew him personally, he did not have a good command of Syriac. Nevertheless, during his patriarch, he consecrated some 75 bishops and metropolitans, including ones for India and China. It was during his reign, however, that the Ilkhan Hazan converted to Islam in 1295 which saw restrictions imposed on Christians and a a decline in their influence. Under the Mongols, various peoples from Central Asia who were in alliance with them were moved to different cities in China to be employed in certain trades and industries, such as the manufacture of embroidered, embroidered gold brocade known as tartar cloth, which was prized and depicted even in European paintings of the time. The Mongols used different ethnic groups to develop international trade and to act as intermediaries in their dealing with the Han Chinese. Among the Central Asian communities of Turkic descent were Christians who took their religion with them to China. They settled in such eastern cities as Yangzhou near the Yangtze River and Guangzhou in Fujian in South China with their presence documented in Chinese records, as well as by Western travelers. During the time period, the ethnic makeup of Central Asia started to change due to the Western movement of various Turkic-speaking peoples. Just so that you've got some idea of uh, Central Asia uh, under the Mongols, you can see what a huge empire it was. And over on the other side, on the right side, some of the cities in South China, which I'll talk in a minute. Unlike its time during the Tang Dynasty, the Church of the East in China in the Mongol period had to deal with rival missions from Rome. There were Franciscans and Dominicans who not only served local communities of European merchants and their families, but sought to convert the local Chinese. We've mentioned already the Franciscan William of Rubruck, who wrote a travelogue of his journey through Central Asia and China, and who provides important information on the Church of the East. For William, these Christians were heretical Nestorians, who he saw wielding considerable power and influence at the Mongol court. Among the things, he tells us, is that they celebrated the liturgy in Syriac, disapproved of crucifixes, and would not let other Christians attend their services unless they were rebaptized. Um, we know that William had a hard time with the Church of the East in China, um, so he's probably saying things perhaps that might not be true, but we have to take his word for it. The Roman mission to China resulted in an appointment of an archbishop and several bishops. There is evidence that the, the king of the Onguts, called George, converted to Catholicism along with his family and court officials, but that after his death in 1298, they all reverted to the Church of the East. So you can see, I think, from that sort of information that people are going over to Western Catholicism, but it's perhaps only a temporary thing before um, the missions uh, move on or something like that, and they revert to their traditional Christianity. 
One of the most important cities in South China under the Mongols was the port city of Guangzhou in Fujian. It hosted foreign communities of Christians, Muslims, and Hindus, and archaeological remains uh, relating to all of them have been found. Uh, Guangzhou was the Hong Kong of its time with its promotion of international trade with Southeast Asia, India, the Persian Gulf, and the Middle East. Its harbor and shipping facilities were lauded by such travelers as Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo, who incidentally left sail from Guangzhou in 1291 with an envoy taking a Mongol bride to the Ilkhans in Persia, which was the last port from which Marco Polo left. Some 70, 70 Christian tombstones and other artifacts have been found in Guangzhou. Many of them were discovered when the city's walls were dismantled in 1938. One of the most interesting inscriptions is that of a certain Mar Solomon, who died in 1313, and who was the administrator responsible for the Christian, Manichaean, and other communities in the region. Now, this is very interesting that it's a Christian who's appointed to oversee this particular office and the different religious communities in the area at that time. Chinese sources tell us that Christians occupied official positions in the local administration and in trade associations. We know, two, we know of two Catholic bishops at Guangzhou, and the tombstone of one of them has been found. The Christians in this city, mostly from Central Asia, continued to use a well-established formula on their headstones. It usually says something like, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, followed by the name of the deceased, and the date, and the dating is using the Seleucid calendar. Many of the inscriptions are in Syriac script, but the language is Turkic. In the Mongol period, a new script based on Tibetan was invented called Fagspa, and this can be seen also on some of the tombstones. So we'll have a look at some of these. I don't know how the, the light is again, how clearly you can see this, but on the left we have one from uh, Yang Zhao. Uh, it's a bilingual uh, inscription in Chinese and in Syriac, but again, the language is Turkic, but the script is Syriac. And again, you can see the top, you can see the cross on the lotus flower, and either side, if you can make them out, are two angels. And on this one from Xinjiang, you can also see the script using the Syriac, but again, um, the two angels on the cross on the lotus flower, which has become very distinctive of the Church of the East's iconography. So if we go to this uh, area in South China, the city, you can see some of the Christian sarcophagi. You can see they're beautifully decorated, and you can see on the left side the uh, cross, sometimes on a lotus flower, sometimes on a cloud, and also the lotus flower uh, petals have been used on the side of the sarcophagi here. So these are all from the Mongol period. That's from the late 13th, through to the, about the middle of the 14th century, when they can be dated. Again, you can see on these headstones, the cross on the lotus, and this time we have a canopy um, above the cross, uh, which is a new um, image that has been introduced in this particular time. And we get these quite um, beautifully carved angels as well, either side of the cross, uh, again, you can see on the left quite clearly a lot of detail has been put into this. So whoever is carving these tombstones and making these inscriptions is very much aware of the tradition of how to represent things for the Church of the East in this particular period in the 13th and 14th century. And on the right, you can see another one here as well. And again, quite an exotic one on the left side here, which as you can see, it looks very Buddhist in its motifs, isn't it? But maybe this isn't a problem. It obviously wasn't a problem for the Christians living in South China in the 13th and 14th centuries. They introduced elements from the local culture, from Buddhist or Taoist tradition into their art as well. On the right, you can see uh, another angel, part of an uh, inscription and part of the iconography there as well. And around this city, I was privileged to be part of a research project at Macquarie University 
uh, which was funded by the Australian government for a number of years. So we were able to research all of these tombstones and to publish on them as well. So you can read about what's been published and the translation of some of the inscriptions as well. And you can see on the left here, we've got half of a panel and you can see again the inscription in Syriac and, and half is missing. And on this side, we seem to have a column uh, with a cross on the lotus flower and a canopy above it. And also these two here, because I mentioned there was another language called Fagspar. It was invented during the uh, Mongol period by the Mongols uh, based on Tibetan, and we even find it on Christian tombstones, so it's quite remarkable. So let's just say something in conclusion. With the fall of the Yuan dynasty in 1368, foreign communities no longer received patronage from the incoming Chinese Ming dynasty, and cities like Guangzhou lost their multi-religious populations, making it difficult for foreigners to survive. It wasn't until the Jesuits arrived in China in the 17th century that evidence for the earlier presence of the Church of the East began to emerge, and it was not until the 20th century that further discoveries were made. In fact, discoveries continue to be made, and the study and interpretation of them is still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parry. Uh, again, just lastly, our 10-minute uh, Q&A session, or just a brief Q&A for any of you that have questions. Um, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, good to see you again, Dr. Parry. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'd just like to know, is there any ancient uh, church sites today that you know of in China or Mongolia? Uh, you mean functioning or just... No, ancient sites from the oh, 8th yes. century. Yes, yes, yes. And they're still discovering them. Um, the Chinese themselves are finding lots of new things in, in Mongolia, in Xinjiang province, in Tafan, all through that area, new discoveries, manuscripts are being found. In uh, Inner Mongolia, a whole series of uh, tombstones were found. No, yeah. I, I actually mean church sites. Yeah, yes, well, that's, that's more difficult. Um, we don't have any structures that you could be absolutely sure were churches, but there are indications, um, certainly in Turkmenistan, around Merv and Samarkand, a few years ago, near Samarkand, an archaeological dig unearthed what is clearly a church structure. Um, the few in, in Xinjiang, which might be, but we still haven't found clear evidence of what the church's architecture and the, the plan of these churches might have been like. But I think that they will find them one day. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions? Thank you. A fascinating uh, symposium. Thank you for inviting us to it. Um, it was amazing when I saw the Syriac script, but as I recall, you said with the Turkish language. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we use this now, and we call it Gershuni, yes. like we write in Arabic, uh -huh. our Assyrian language. Uh -huh. So do you know why those people, or who were those people? Why, why they, uh, were they Turks, or they were Assyrians? No, they're Turk. They're Turkic-speaking people, uh, Uyghurs, Uzbeks, a whole range of different tribes, which came into cent Chinese Central Asia and then further to the West, in from the 6th, 7th, 8th century, in the Tang Dynasty, they were moving into these areas more, than, more and more. Um, but because there was already Sogdian, 
which had used the um, Syriac script as well. Um, they took over the writing tradition and the scripts that were available to them as they came into these areas and became more settled communities. Then they started wanting to write things down and do things. So these are Turkic-speaking people. So yes, we refer to Turkish today because we associate it with the country of Turkey and so on. But you have to remember that a lot of these Turkic-speaking peoples have moved through Central Asia before they got to the West. And many of them had been Christians or Buddhists or Manichaeans before they became Muslims. This is going to happen gradually between the Tang and the, the Mongol period. There's going to be an Islamicization of Central Asia, which is going to change the religious perspective on that geography. But also the ethnicity has changed and is changing as well. So what these people were doing were using a writing script and tradition that they was there already and adapting it to their own needs. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just one last question. Thank you, Dr. Perry. My name is Myung Hua Park. I actually look like Chinese, but I'm Korean. <laughs> and the, one of the things that uh, we are very proud of the Korean uh, Christian, Christianity, especially Catholicism, is that we did not receive a missionary. The Koreans went to China and then learned about the Catholicism and brought it. That was one of the very mm. special things. But one of the things that I guess that this symposium is making us to uh, feel something that we, what we need to learn today by learning the past. The, His Holiness, thank you so much for having this opportunity. But uh, I wonder, the, your study, uh, your research, Dr. Perry, that it's incredible to Chinese Christians to know that their Christianity goes way back. Yep. Does that make the Christians in China today any different approach, different appreciation of their Christian presence? It does. Um... And in Hong Kong, there's been quite an interesting movement amongst uh, Christians in Hong Kong especially. I'm not sure where we're all up to at the moment. Um, to try to appropriate this earlier history, certainly. And what it means is, I think, for Christians in Asia, is we don't have to worry about later Jesuits or Protestants coming to Asia. There is an indigenous Christianity already there, it's the Church of the East. So trying to rediscover this and reappropriate it is a process that is happening, certainly. And on the Korean situation, there is some evidence of, of Christians um, coming into Korea from China, and it may be even to Japan, but this is all very debatable. But it's possible. If they could be there in China, then there's no reason they couldn't have gone further east into Korea or, and possibly into Japan as well. But it is interesting, the reappropriation of this is important, I think. Yeah. Doctor, if I can ask for you to remain on stage, um, and I'd like to invite back our guest speakers. Uh, it is an honor for the symposium today to gift our speakers uh, with a gift as a token of our appreciation. So, uh, Ashisha William and Proto Presbyter Dr. Dora Kostaki. So, um, firstly, to uh, Dr. Doru Kostaki, um, just as a token of our appreciation for your invaluable contribution today. And 
to Kashisha William Tuma, uh, presented by students from St. Narsay Syrian College. And Dr. Ken Parry. <laughs> Thank you again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was getting to that. Our keynote presenter and the guest of honor for today, His Holiness Mod Awa Rul, Mod Awa the Third Catholicos Patriarch. Please remain upstanding. Um, we have now come to the end of today's symposium. On behalf of the Assyrian Church of the East, Archdiocese of Australia, New Zealand, and Lebanon, together with Nasibus Assyrian Theological College, we thank you for your attendance today. We extend a very special thank you to our keynote presenter, His Holiness, Mod Awa III, Catholicos Patriarch, and our esteemed speakers, for their attendance and participation today. Um, your Holiness, uh, we humbly ask that you keep us in your prayers. As children of the Holy Church, pray that God may protect us from all harm hidden and open, that the merciful Lord will keep, him, keep us at his right hand and guide our steps in this unpredictable world as we fight the good fight. Your Holiness, we also ask you to pray for Nasibus Assyrian Theological College. May it always be in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, may it foster students who continually fulfill God's will and be fruitful for generations to come. Uh, please be upstanding as His Holiness and our esteemed speakers make their departure.